Welcome to the International Thyroid Awareness Week, our 15th edition. Today, Saturday, May 27th, 2023, we will be presenting our second webinar as part of our week-long commemoration of the International Thyroid Awareness Week. Today, we have two topics, genetics and thyroid, presented by Dr. Alexandra Dumitrescu, MD, PhD, and Associate Professor at the University of Chicago Medical Center and Genetics and Autoimmunity, presented by Professor Milos Sarkovic, MD, PhD, at the Medical Faculty at the University of Belgrade. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors, notably Merck, who've been with us for the past 15 years, Exalexis, Ipsen, Ipsa, and Immunovant. Without further ado, here is your host, Ashok Basin, President of the Thyroid Federation International. Uh, welcome to the 15th International Thyroid Awareness Week. Today is May 27, 2023, and we have audiences right from Australia in the east, far east uh, to the west in USA, Canada, and Brazil, Argentina, and South America. So um, uh, today we are talking about thyroid and genetics and thyroid and autoimmunity. We have uh, two speakers today, and one of the speakers that I'm going to introduce right now is uh, Dr. Alexandra uh, Dimitrescu, who is MD, PhD, and uh, she's an endocrinologist who specializes in diagnosis and treatment of thyroid disease. Um, Dr. Dimitrescu is uh, from University of Chicago, and her research focuses on identifying inherited genetic mutations that can cause thyroid disease and metabolic disorder. Who better? Then, Dr. Alexandra, to tell us about thyroid and genetics. Over to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandra, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to speak uh, for uh, our audience today uh, for Thyroid Federation International. Over to Dr. Alexandra. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Alexandra Dumitrescu, and I will, pre I will present a lecture on genetics and thyroid. This lecture is for the World Thyroid Day. I will start by introducing thyroid gland and thyroid hormones. So thyroid gland is an endocrine gland that's located in the anterior part of the neck, and it produces thyroid hormones, T4, a pro-hormone, and the active hormone, T3. Thyroid hormones control the expression of multiple genes throughout the body through binding of receptors located in the nucleus. Iodine makes up more than half of the molecular weight of the thyroid hormones, and adequate intake is needed. Iodine deficiency remains a common cause of thyroid hormone insufficiency in parts of the world. Thyroid hormone is essential for normal development during fetal development and childhood, and its deficiency at this time can have long lasting effects. Thyroid diseases is specifically acquired thyroid dysfunctions are common, mostly due to autoimmune thyroid disease. Manifestations of thyroid hormone deficiency or excess can be nonspecific and overlap with other conditions. Measurement of thyroid uh, of serum thyroid hormone levels is needed to determine if there is indeed a thyroid dysfunction. Thyroid gland imaging is recommended when thyroid diseases are diagnosed, and the preferred method to use is ultrasound. Underactive thyroid function can be diagnosed and treated by doctors of multiple specialties, not only by endocrinologists. However, overactive thyroid function is specifically treated by endocrine specialists. In particular, genetic thyroid diseases are caused by defects in genes that control the correct development of the thyroid gland or the steps involved in thyroid hormone synthesis, secretion, and action at the cellular level. Genetic defects result in absent or altered levels of thyroid hormone in blood or in the cells and can result in severe manifestations. There is familial clustering of these disorders as they are inherited. Studies of family with inherited thyroid abnormalities has been essential in characterizing many processes involved in normal thyroid function. 
Congenital hypothyroidism, in particular, is the most frequent neonatal endocrine disorder. There's, therefore, neonatal screening has been implemented to diagnose this as early as possible. One of the most common preventable forms of mental retardation worldwide is uh, congenital hypothyroidism. Of note, thyroid dysgenesis accounts for 65% of congenital hypothyroidism. However, a genetic cause is identified in less than 5% of patients. In this slide, several important processes related to thyroid are, um, are shown. On the left side is the a schematic representation of the thyroid hormone axis with the thyroid gland producing T3 and T4, pituitary producing TSH, and the hypothalamus producing TRH. Here it's shown um, a schematically represented a target cell with the thyroid hormone um, crossing the, the membranes through active transmembrane transport um, with several, several transporters being identified. Once inside the cell, thyroid hormone is metabolized by the DIO dinases, and the active thyroid hormone then has access to the nucleus and binds thyroid hormone receptors beta and alpha. Here it re are represented um, important steps in thyroid hormone synthesis and secretion. Uh, these processes happen in the, for, in the functional unit of the thyroid, uh, the follicular cell. Um, such processes are iodine transport, iodination of the thyroglobulin coupling, uh, endocytosis, proteolysis, and then secretion of thyroid hormone in uh, circulation. Defects in all in processes um, throughout um, all of these steps uh, have been reported, and uh, I will cover um, some of these uh, genetic defects. I will present uh, genetic disorders that affect thyroid development and are classified as dysgenesis, a disorder that affect thyroid hormone biosynthesis and they are classified as dyshormonogenesis, and disorder that affect thyroid hormone action, and these are labeled as uh, syndromes of insensitivity to thyroid hormone. Regarding this genesis, um, in this slide, in this table, um, genetic defects that have been shown to cause primary congenital hypothyroidism with thyroid dysgenesis are summarized. The genes identified are named here, and the OMIM IDs are also included. The thyroid phenotype manifested is included, the mode of inheritance, autosomal dominant or recessive, and the associated pathologies uh, when known. Uh, the, some of these defects have been described a while ago. Some of the defects are more recent. They can manifest with lack of thyroid, with the small thyroids, with the uh, misplaced thyroid or half a thyroid or thyroid asymmetry. And um, they can have additional uh, manifestation depending on the genetic defect. Of note, um, this type of congenital hypothyroidism can be treated with uh, uh, thyroid hormone supplementation and replacement depending on the severity of the defect. Regarding this hormonogenesis, uh, this table summarizes the, gen the genes known to cause primary congenital hypothyroidism with thyroid dyshormonogenesis. And um, um, uh, similarly, the name of the genes and the OMIM IDs are included, uh, the ultrasound uh, appearance of the thyroid gland, the levels of thyroglobulin in serum, and if there are any associated pathologies and the uh, mode of transmission. Um, um, many of these defects have been reported a while ago, and some of them have been more recent. Of note, this hormonogenesis characteristically presents with goiter, and uh, uh, all uh, genetic defects, uh, except for thyroglobulin defect itself, uh, manifest with high serum thyroglobulin level. 
Um, I will now briefly uh, show uh, defects uh, in uh, uh, the function of the pituitary and the hypothalamus that have been associated with congenital hypothyroidism. So some of these defects manifest with isolated central congenital hypothyroidism, and these are TSH beta, TRH receptor, TBL1X, IRS4, and the uh, um, transmission is autosomal recessive or X-linked. Um, so this specifically has, uh, this specifically manifest with uh, central congenital hypothyroidism. Another class of defects manifest with uh, central congenital hypothyroidism together with other pituitary abnormalities. And um, again, the genetic defects are included here, the other manifestations and the modern inheritance. And the last uh, group of such um, uh, disorders uh, that I include here are central uh, congenital hypothyroidism in the context of other syndromes. So these are broad syndromes that can have a pituitary manifestations, including central congenital hypothyroidism and other uh, much broader manifestations. Um, similar to the genetic defects causing primary congenital hypothyroidism, central uh, congenital hypothyroidism would be treated with thyroid hormone supplementation or replacement, depending on the severity, in addition to other um, other hormonal treatments or additional treatments depending on the uh, manifestations. Um, I will now uh, go over syndromes of insensitivity to thyroid hormone, which uh, are much more challenging to treat uh, compared to the other uh, genetic defects that I mentioned uh, previously. So these syndromes are, are, are categorized in three groups, uh, defects in thyroid hormone receptor beta and alpha that result in the syndromes of resistance to thyroid hormone beta and alpha, uh, thyroid hormone transmember transporter defects and the transporter that has been characterized so far uh, is a monocarboxylate transporter 8. And the third group, a thyroid hormone metabolism defect. And the defects characterized so far are SBP2 and the adenase 1. And I will go in more details uh, about these syndromes. Specifically uh, for resistance to thyroid hormone syndrome. Um, uh, the clinical syndrome of resistance to thyroid hormone beta was first described in 1967 by Dr. Samuel Refetov, and it's also known as the Refetov syndrome. Mutations in the thyroid hormone receptor beta gene have been described much later in 1989, and then most commonly, and the large majority actually, these mutations are heterozygous uh, mutation, uh, autosomal dominant inheritance, uh, however, the initial family that was reported by Dr. Refetov harbored homozygous deletion of the thyroid hormone receptor beta locus. To date, more than 900 families are known with this syndrome and more than 230 mutations have been characterized. And here it's uh, schematically represented um, uh, the structure of the uh, thyroid hormone beta with the two isoforms, beta-1 and beta-2, that are synthesized at this locus. The N-terminal is different between the two isoforms, while the rest of the proteins are identical. Um, the uh, phenotype uh, of the syndrome has characteristic thyroid function test with high free T4, high free T3, high reverse T3 with normal or slightly elevated TSH and other manifestation, attention deficit disorder, tachycardia and goiter. Here are shown the uh, uh, symptoms and signs in patients with resistance to thyroid hormone beta, uh, uh, the frequency uh, that they are present with the nervous system manifestation, growth and development abnormalities. Treatment of this syndrome is symptomatic and um, uh, it's important to note that it's recommended to avoid thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine ablation in these patients as this uh, would result in a much more difficult management of these patients. 
Next, a resistance to thyroid hormone alpha was first reported in 2012, also autosomal dominant inheritance. And uh, so far, uh, about 20 families uh, have been identified with mutation in the thyroid hormone receptor alpha gene. Here, it's a schematic representation of the uh, of the isoforms produced by the thyroid hormone receptor alpha gene, isoform alpha-1 and alpha-2, with identical and terminal domain, DNA binding domain, and part of the hormone binding domain. Uh, of note, the C terminus of these two isoforms are different. Uh, this is a schematic representation of the mutations that have been reported in the thyroid hormone receptor alpha gene with a group of mutation in the C-terminus that are present just in the TR-alpha-1 isoforms, and they tend to be very severe in manifestations, and the group of mutations that are common to both isoforms. Also shown are the thyroid hormone receptor beta mutation corresponding to the thyroid hormone receptor alpha mutation identified. And these have been also, um, some of them have been characterized and uh, um, known to, to cause resistance to thyroid hormone beta. In terms of uh, the phenotype of this patient, the characteristic thyroid tests are low free T4, normal or slightly elevated free T3, low reverse T3, and normal TSH. There are also other manifestations uh, with delayed skeletal development and gastrointestinal dysmotility. In severe cases, uh, they can manifest neuro neurodevelopmental delay. Um, the other features, anemia, skeletal dysplasia, sometimes dysmorphic features, and uh, constipation are present in most of these patients. Treatment with levothyroxine has been shown to improve growth and constipation. However, it's not, uh, um, it does not not improve anemia. The long-term effect of this treatment uh, is unknown. Uh, we'll go over the thyroid hormone transporter, uh, transmembrane transporter defects, MCT8. Uh, this MCT stands for monocarboxylate transporter 8. This was first reported in 2004, and uh, um, it presents with a very characteristic thyroid phenotype with high T3, low T4, low reverse T3, and normal or slightly elevated TSH. This transporter is on the X chromosome. It has a pattern characteristic for X-linked inherited defects with the uh, uh, severe syndrome in males. Um, uh, specifically, neurological abnormalities in males with these defects are quite severe. Developmental delay, dystonic movements, hypotonia, and they are unable to hold their head, progressive spasticity, and mental retardation. Um, these uh, patients are non-ambulatory and um, uh, non-verbal uh, in most cases, and uh, they are dependent on care throughout their life. More than 100 families are known worldwide, and there, is, there are treatment challenges in MCTA deficiency. Uh, specifically, there is already high circulating thyroid hormone level. Um, uh, but unfortunately, this is not available to the brain due to this defect in this transporter. So uh, the big uh, difficulty has been how to specifically deliver thyroid hormone to the brain. And um, uh, there is a lot of research ongoing in this defect, which is quite severe. Uh, the last group of genetic defects that I will uh, present are thyroid hormone metabolism defects. And for this, I will introduce the deodinases, deodinase 1, 2, and 3, which metabolize thyroid hormone and control the availability of the active hormone T3. These are selenoenzymes. They require selenium in form of selenocysteine amino acid for enzymatic activity. They metabolize uh, the prohormone T4 and, and um, uh, sequential steps uh, to generate the active hormone T3 or inactive metabolites. The iodinase 1 is an activating mutation and uh, controls the serum levels of T3, 
whereas the ODNAs 2 and 3 fine-tune the intracellular availability of T3, with the ODNAs 2 being an activating enzyme and the ODNAs 3 an inactivating enzyme. Genetic defects in these, uh, uh, in the DODNAs genes have remained elusive for a long time. And uh, uh, even though researchers have been uh, looking for these defects. So uh, to understand um, um, the odinases, uh, I will introduce selenocysteine incorporation uh, that is required for the selenoprotein synthesis. Um, the messenger RNA of selenoproteins uh, includes uh, cesis elements in the three prime UTR of these genes. And uh, this element binds uh, cesis binding protein 2 or SBP2. Additional transacting factors are required to recode a, a normal UGA stop codon into a selenocysteine amino acid codon. So SBP2 is essential for selenoprotein uh, synthesis. And of note, the human selenoprotein proteome uh, comprises uh, 25 selenoproteins. And the eudinases are just three of these uh, selenoproteins. The first genetic defect uh, uh, affecting the eudinases is um, SBP2. Uh, this was first re reported in 2005 and has a recessive inheritance. Again, this syndrome manifests with pathognomonic thyroid function tests that have been used to uh, characterize additional patients with this defect. And uh, different from the other syndrome, T3 is low, T4 is high, reverse T3 is high, and TSH is only slightly elevated. As expected for a, a defect uh, that uh, uh, affects an entire class of proteins, uh, there is a multi-system disorder associated with this uh, thyroid, thyroid function test. There is a growth delay, delayed bone age, which are very characteristic in all patients with this defect. Additional manifestation can be fasting hypoglycemia, male infertility, myopathy and hypercoordination, hearing loss and immune deficiencies. And uh, there is a spectrum of presentation with mild cases and more severe cases that harbor all these manifestations. Uh, treatment in this condition, T3 can be used to treat the specific uh, thyroid hormone deficiency in the cells and throughout the body, but additional symptomatic treatment is needed for other manifestations. The last genetic defect that I will cover is the ODNAs1 genetic defect. We reported to families with this, and that report is recent in 2021. The families, the affected individuals in this family harbored heterozygous mutations, and uh, that manifested with elevated reverse T3 and elevated reverse T3 to T3 ratio. The other thyroid function tests were normal or just slightly abnormal. There were no other obvious phenotypes in these heterozygous patients. However, However, it remains to be determined if homozygous or biallelic effects are identified in the ODNAs1. A treatment is not needed uh, unless there is thyroid gland is absent either from surgery or from uh, ablation or autoimmune disease. I will conclude with acknowledgement. I want to mention Dr. Uh, my mentors, Dr. Samuel Refetov and Dr. Weiss. Dr. Refetov has been my mentor uh, since I started uh, my uh, graduate studies in uh, human genetics and inherited thyroid diseases. Uh, I want to mention Dr. Antonio Bianco has been a collaborator in the recent years. I want to acknowledge referring physicians who have made studies in families with inherited thyroid disease possible. Lab members who have worked on these defects over the years. The University of Chicago, where I've been working for 23 years in training and then as a physician scientist, funding from NIH. And here it's included my email address for referral of patients and families with inherited abnormal thyroid function tests. Thank you for your attention. Today, uh, as part of our lecture series, uh, now uh, Dr. Uh, Milos uh, Zarkovic is going to speak on genetics and autoimmunity. Just a few words on Dr. Milos Zarkovic. Dr. Milos Zarkovic has been associated with the uh, European Thyroid Association for a very long time and uh, also held a beautiful European Thyroid Congress in Belgrade a while ago. And he's a professor 
uh, at your medical faculty, University of Belgrade. And uh, here, over to you, Dr. Milos. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and helping us out with uh, this very important uh, lecture series, which is on uh, genetics and uh, thyroid this year. Over to you, Dr. Milos. Good afternoon. I'm Milos Zarkovic, and I am professor of endocrinology at the Belgrade University. Today, we are going to discuss genetics and thyroid autoimmunity. First, I'm going to define some terms that we are going, that I'm going to use during this talk. First, what is the gene? The gene is the basic unit of inheritance. The gene contains information needed to specify physical and biological characteristics of organisms, and are passed from parents to offspring. Gene consists from DNA, and the smallest unit of DNA is called nucleotide. So gene consists of a strand of DNA, and those genes are packed together in the chromosome. Important definitions are what is allele, and allele is alternative form of a gene, or a version of a gene. One allele is inherited from each parent, and it can be normal, or so-called violet type, because it's found in the wilderness, or abnormal or mutant alleles. Another, form, uh, another important term is a polymorphism, from Greek meaning many shaped, and that refers to the presence of two or more variant forms of a specific, of specific DNA sequence, and that can occur among different individuals or populations. The most common type of polymorphism involves variation at the single nucleotide, called, also called single nucleotide polymorphism or SNPs. So these are the most important terms that we are going to use. Now, what happens with the disease? So this is a product of interaction between genes and environment. And environment also can, in a specific way, modify how the genes are interpreted. So these are called epigenetic influences. Epigenetic chains are reversible. Epigenetic changes do not change DNA sequence, but epigenetic changes change how body interprets a DNA sequence. Now, there is another thing. There are certain group of diseases that are hereditary, like some types of hereditary cancer syndromes. These diseases are completely determined by the genes, and there is very, very small input on the of environment. Now, what we want to see is, how, what is the influence on the genes of genes on the thyroid autoimmune disease? Now, the first and usual way to study influence on the genes on a certain disease is studying the twins. There are two types of twins. One type is monozygotic twins. So there's identical twins. They have completely same genome. And another type of twins in dizygotic twins. They are different. Their genome is not the same. So we look at what the proportion of a <clears throat> twins has the disease. So if one twin has a disease, what's the proportion of the twins when the both things have the diseases? And if you look at the monozygotic twins, it's about 55%. In dizygotic twins, regarding autoimmune thyroid disease, well, it's uh, about zero. So we see that there is a significant concordance between the twins regarding autoimmune thyroiditis, but it's not absolute. Now, if we have enough patient, we can look and see what's the part of the variance is played by the genes and what part of the variance of the disease is played by the environment. And if we look at the Hashimoto disease, so genetics explain about 60% of the variant. The same is in uh, Graves disease. And the 40% of the variance is explained by environment. So you see that you need a certain type of genetic to get to the Hashimoto disease or Graves disease, autoimmune thyroid disease, but it's not enough. Almost half of it must come from the environment. If we compare that to Edison's disease, that's almost completely genetically defined. So, okay, we know that there is significant influence of genes, development of autoimmune, autoimmune thyroid disease, but there is also significant influence of environment. 
Now, the things are actually a bit more complicated when we are talking about autoimmune thyroid disease, because it's not just interplay between environment and genes, but also it's an interplay between thyroid and the immune system. So the thyroid is influenced by immune system, the immune system is influenced by the thyroid, and everything is influenced by both environment and genes. Now, how can we look? What is the simplest look? The simplest way to look into the immune system. What we use is something that's called human leukocyte antigen system. And it's a system of cell proteins that are responsible for the regulation of the immune system. But we know that it's controlled by the genes, and these genes are located in chromosome 6. So if we look at the different HLL alleles, we see that certain HLL alleles are associated with increased risk of different autoimmune diseases. So the same is for autoimmune thyroid diseases. Certain HLA alleles are associated with susceptibility for Hashimoto's disease or Graves' disease, and some other as associated with a, as a, with a protection from the autoimmune thyroid diseases. So yes, there is influence of HLA, and then later on we will see that we can use certain HLA polymorphism to predict development or recurrence of hyperthyroidism. There are some other genes that are also very important in development of thyroid autoimmune disease. One is PTPN22, and it is one of the proteins involved with the regulation of T cell function, and it's also associated with other autoimmune diseases, such as systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Another is CTLA-4, and it's protein found on T cells that keeps body immune responses in track. TLA-4 stops T cells from killing other cells. And there is interleukin-2 receptor alpha chain that's also in, involved in regulatory immune response. And all these genes, actually all the varieties of these genes, polymorphism of these genes, are involved in development of autoimmune, autoimmune thyroid disease. Now there is another thing that is also very interesting because it's so-called CT CD40 gene. And that's interesting because CD40 is expressed both on thyroid cells and on the uh, immune cells. Now, what happens when you expose thyroid cells to inflammation or iodine excess? You got uh, hyperexpression of CD40. And when you have hyperexpression of CD40, then you get a stimulation of immune system, both by stimulation of these cells and by the production of interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 stimulates B cells and then they produce thyroid antibodies, anti-thyroid antibodies. Interestingly, we have tocilizumab, a drug that blocks in interleukin-6 receptor that we use to treat Graves' disease. So that's another way how the thyroid and immune system interact. So we were talking about immune system. Now what's happening with the thyroid? One of the very interesting things is how we process the TSH receptor. So there are also certain polymorphisms in TSH receptor gene. And then we say something that's called splicing variants. So we have full length receptor, TSH receptor, and then we have some sort of variants, and so, so splicing variants. And according to one of the hypotheses, if you have a lot of those splicing variants, they're more immunogenic, and then they cause they cause immune system to react also to the full sequence. So that was one of the theories how Graves' disease develops. But another very interesting thing is that TSH receptors are not only expressed or not only present in the thyroid cells; they are also present in thymus. Now, thymus is a small organ within the rib cage just behind the sternum. And this is time is exceedingly, extremely important for the normal development of immune systems. So-called T cells are actually derived from thymus. And now, if you look at all these pictures, the important thing is that 
TSH receptor is expressed in the thymus on the thymic cells together with other immune uh, products, immune proteins. Now, if you look at this, you will see that you have different splicing variants expressed both in thyroid and in the thymus. So one other, uh, another theory is that in order to have uh, the antithyroid antibodies, you need to have you need to have a problem with immunological tolerance because uh, immune system learns about what is you, uh, what is the organism, and what's the foreign. So if you, the immune system and the uh, thyroid is uh, thymus is very important for that. And if you, there if the immune system does not learn what's you, what's your proteins, he can make autoantibodies. So if there is less reduced expression of TSH receptor within the thymus, then that can be uh, that can be interpreted as a foreign protein, and then the immune system can build autoantibodies against TSH receptor. Now there is another important protein that can also because be, uh, that genetics of that protein, changes in genetics of that protein, polymorphism in gene can also cause autoimmune disease. And that's thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is the most important protein in thyroid gland. So if you have a different certain polymorphisms, so that thyroglobulin is a little bit different than usual or than, than the wild type, then it can be more immunogenic. And, and you see, if you have certain polymorphisms, like this is LLCC, then odds ratio for development, or let's call, let's call it risk for development, or thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disease is doubled. And if it is combined with certain HLA polymorphisms, the risk is six times more. So we have a definite interplay between certain characteristics of thyroid proteins and certain characteristics of immune system. So how do we use it? So this is a great score. Great score is a score to predict the risk of recurrence of hyperthyroidism before we started treating patients. There are two risk scores. There is a great score, and the great score does not include different polymorphisms. And the great plus score, and the great plus score uses HLA polymorphisms and PTPN22 polymorphism. And when you use genetic information that we can and we have you see that we have a very good prediction who is going to relapse and who is going to be treated it's very useful so if you have high risk of relapse of hyperthyroidism you can you know shorten the period of drug treatment and go right to operation of radioactive iodine but there is another thing not, the genetics is not only important for the prediction of the disease, but also there are certain things regarding the, th regarding the treatment, especially treatment of a patient with hypothyroidism. So the important thing is that in certain organs, such as the brain cortex and brown adipose tissue, most of the T3 and the T3 is actually active hormone. T4 is a prohormone, and under the action of certain group of enzymes called diodinases, T3 is converted to active form, the active hormone, and that's T3. And each tissue has diodinase within the cells, and they actually uh, produce absolutely specific quantities of the T3 for each tissue. So these diadenases are extremely important. And not only that, because uh, if you look at the diadenase effect, so thyroid secretes about five micrograms per day of T3. Another five micrograms a day is produced by the liver and kidney. But the 20 micrograms are produced in the other tissues, acting by the action of diadenases. And there is a theory or hypothesis that polymorphism of certain diodinases can influence uh, quality of life of patient treated with hyperthyroidism. It's not yet confirmed, but it's a very interesting hypothesis. And then perhaps we will find a certain group of patients based on their genetic characteristics 
that can be treated with different approaches or that substituted to, with different approaches uh, and that not only with levothyroxine. So the genetics is very important. So what can we conclude from this? Well, thyroid autoimmunity is dependent of genetic of the patient, but it's genetic of the patient is not only, it's just half of the story. Another half is the environment. So the environment together with genetics is necessary to express or to cause thyroid diseases, thyroid autoimmune diseases. And then with certain knowledges of genetics, we could perhaps pinpoint certain people who are at risk. And also with the knowledge of genetics, we can improve the treatment of our patients. Thank you. We are coming to the conclusion of a lecture series uh, on uh, this occasion of 15th International Thyroid Awareness Week, 2023. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Jamie Nisbet uh, for putting the webinar together and arranging uh, the whole uh, webinar series for us. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. I would also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Merck, uh, with whom we have 15 years of cooperation for International Thyroid Awareness Week. So Merck, Horizon, IPSA, Exilexis, Aminovant, and Ipsen. We'd like to thank all of them uh, for helping us out for this. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Dr. Milos Zarkovic, thank you very much. And Dr. Alexandra, thank you very much for putting this together. And uh, see you all for next webinar series, and we will be informing you via our thyroid newsletter. Uh, Thank you all and bye for now.